Okay, so last, uh, last session we were talking about the full armor of God and God's desire that we as his people be protected fully with an armor. And that armor is intended for us to be victorious in battle. So we kind of went over that. It's going to be on the previous lesson. So I want to give you some uh, warfare scriptures that are also in line with what we talked about uh, last week. And uh, one of them is about the weapons of our warfare. And it says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5, For we walk in the flesh as mortal people, but, but we are not carrying on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of men. This is a spiritual battle that God is talking about, not a military uh, exercise or military battle. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. They, are, they are, are not weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful. They are divinely empowered and energized and imparted to us for the destruction of fortresses. When you think about a fortress, what do you, what do you see? You see something that is built up that's very strong and that's got walls around it or you know, has got you know, like a castle that it's impossible to penetrate. That's the whole idea of a fortress. In medieval times, that's where we would see the visual of that. Uh, but we have divine power to, dis to destroy the fortresses of the enemy. We have the ability to do that. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. So, you know, I look at it like this. We have ability to destroy evil fortresses of the enemy, but we also have the ability to build a fortress of truth in our mind and our heart. And it says here, we're taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. A lot of our battle is in our mind. This is where the enemy tries to find those vulnerable areas. And all of us have stories to tell about that battle, that battlefield. I think it's Joyce Meyer that talked about it, the battlefield of the mind. This is an accurate description because we deal with that battle every day, but we can be victorious every day. We can be victorious in the, the mind battle, if you will, and we can walk in peace and victory in, in our mind because we have been given the mind of Christ. Now, if we have the mind of Jesus and that available mind to us, then we're not gonna be, have a mind that's confused and full of torment. No, we're going to have a mind that is peace, that is in the knowledge of God, that is connected to the truth and to the love of the Father. And this is where our thoughts need to go and be ascending, if you will. And so, but it takes discipline. It takes a, a, a practical application every day, which God is so good and the Holy Spirit is so good to help us every day to win that battle and to rise above the torments, the mental torments, I have yet to meet a Christian that does not have mental torment in some respects. There's different levels of it. Some of, some of us has gone, have gone through extreme torment, extreme trauma. Some is just kind of an uneasy situation that you go through. But it doesn't matter the level of it. God has designed that we are victorious. And this is the mindset you need to start with. No, wait a second. I don't have to let this mental battle have victory over me and overwhelm me every time, every day. God has given me the ability to overwhelm this in his power, in his truth, in his word, in his supernatural uh, touch that he puts into my heart by his spirit. And let me just say this, and I, I'll say this, when, we, when I teach about the prophetic, which is so, I love to put it like this, you know that when you have the mind of Christ, you have the Spirit of God in you. How many of you know that is true about you? You are born again, 
and baptized in the Holy Spirit. So you, not only you are born of God with the nature of God that has renewed your spirit to life, in that spirit man looks just like Jesus. And, uh, and But the empowerment of the baptism of the Holy Spirit releases the gifts and the ministry and the call of God upon your life that you can move in power and that grace and ability that he's intended for all of you upon the call that he's, he's given each of you. And so that's an exciting part, next part to what we want to find out about what God has for us. But if you have the Spirit of God in you, and you have the mind of Christ, that means that God shares the same headspace as you do. That means that God has given you his thoughts, and you may not, you may even be missing it. You may be hearing him talk to you all the time, and you've been blowing it off, not realizing that it was God. I would venture to say that because, you know, I, I feel like I've come to know the Lord in, in, a, in, a, in a way that he t is talking to us all the time. Yeah. He's, he, the Holy Spirit in you is always leading you, communicating with you his love, his grace, his truth, his revelation of Jesus, of the love of the Father. This is the Spirit of God in you. And many times when we're so obsessing or tormented or overwhelmed in our thought life, we can't hear a blame thing from the Lord because there's no room. So we want to learn how to cast down the strongholds in our mind, our mindsets. We want to get rid of the old mindsets to make room for the new. And God has decided and in his will that we have mind peace and a rest in our soul. And your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And many, many of, of you might think, I have no idea what that would look like. I have no idea what it would look like for me to be walking in peace like that and the rest of God, because every day is such a struggle. But we're gonna get there. We're gonna learn the practical parts of this. Part of it is learning to deal with demons learning how to recognize what they're up to, learning how to recognize how they have affected you or afflicted you or bound you or tormented. This is going to be a time where we're going to have zero tolerance. And you will be able to rise above that. Not only will you be able to walk in a new area of truth and victory in your life, but you're going to be able to help others get going to victory, like Christopher. Christopher and Tamlin, his wife, they've stepped out more and more in ministering to people, and they see miracles all the time. I mean, this is how we should live. I think miracles all the time. I may not be experiencing them, but I think them, because I know that my God is miraculous. And I, have, I should be expecting nothing less from him, because he is my Lord, my Savior, my God. My, my strong tower, my shield, the one that has empowered me to live a victorious life, to live an overcoming life. And it is God's will that you triumph in every area of your life. I'm not saying that there aren't going to be those days and times when you're going through something and uh, you, you're going to learn from it. You're going to grow out from that pressure. You're going to grow out from that difficulty, that struggle. But the only way you can do that is when you're intentional about believing what God is saying to you. God, you've given me everything I need to rise above this. And I'm going to, I love, you know who I love to listen to is Graham Cook. I'm going to throw his name out there for you guys to listen to him because he is so profound about understanding the peace and the rest of God. And he's the heart, he speaks the heart of the Father. But you know what I love, what Graham Cook talks about? He says, you're going to love the learning. And we have not loved the learning. We've struggled with that. We've kicked against it. We've, we've resisted it. We, we don't understand it. We, we get all running amok, and we don't know how to... to um, to, to rise above it and, and to learn how to walk patiently through something, knowing that your God is with you and seeing you through. So, you know, make up your mind. God, no matter what, I'm, I'm going to do a shift here. Instead of being angry and bitter, 
and frustrated and mad at Christians or mad at somebody else or mad at the pastor or whatever it might, however it might manifest. It might not, it might be somebody on the job or whatever. Instead of being frustrated with that, why don't you just step into the peace of God and do it by faith and say, Lord, I'm going to love the learning of what you want to show me in this. And I'm going to grow stronger. I'm going to rise up and I'm going to be the child of the king. And you need to change the mindset. There's a shift of mindsets going on right now because God wants to encourage you as to who you are and what you have available. So whether we reap or sow, we must be prepared to do what God ordained us for. We are to have a renewed mind, a renewed heart, a renewed life, and as a helmet that protects your head, salvation protects us against Satan and spirits. People that are unsaved do not have that ability to be protected against Satan and evil spirits. They're seeking out different ways, maybe using occult practices to deal with evil spirits, and all they're doing is making it worse. So I'm just saying that we're going to learn how to deal with Satan and evil spirits. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we're going to start using the Word of God and quoting the Bible and speaking the Word over our situation. And using the Word of God in a prophetic way, God, I'm releasing this Word of God over this situation, this promise that you've given me, and I'm speaking it, and I'm releasing it over that situation, making that declaration in Jesus' name. So that's the sword of the Spirit. Thank you for that. We got the air on. So in Ephesians 6, 18, with all prayer and petition, with specific requests at all times, on every occasion and in every season in the spirit and with, his, and with this in view, stay alert and all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all of God's people. So this is where we stand in the gap for other people. And the, notice the word perseverance. We're going to persevere. We're going to intercede. We're going to stand in the gap. We're going to support each other in prayer. So it's not only just about you. It's about you giving yourself over in prayer and petition for others and learning how to help them win the battles that they might be facing. There's one more thing I'm going to say before we go into the cosmic um, crash called the fall of Lucifer. Um, we, I, I learned something here recently when I fell into a situation where I got very, I got very grieved. My very best girlfriend that I loved like a sister that I grew up with here in, uh, in Escondido since we were kids. She moved away to another state. And I was so used to having my friend around. She was so dear to me and we went through so much together. And it was almost this giant hole. And I felt, I found myself feeling so empty and lost and actually disoriented and I realized that I was in grief over the loss of my friend and I listen I know what the word says I know about warfare but when you're on your own and when trying to figure it out on your own you just need the help of others and that's why we need to pray for each other right but I said to the Lord I said God I don't know how to handle this just as quick as the bat of an eyelash. I heard the Spirit of God say to me, Pam, you just need to step into the secret place. Why didn't I think of that? The secret place of the Most High is something that you step into by faith. Read Psalm 91. Read what is available to us in Psalm 91. It is divine protection. It is the promise of God to protect us and to, and to help us through. And, and to protect us from the, the plans of darkness and the, 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 pestilent, the, the pestilence, the sickness, the disease, whatever it is, God's promise is right there. But one of the things that he is telling us to do is to step in to the secret place. Have you guys ever done that? Well, listen, 
religious minds would tell you that you've got to go on a fast for 21 days and then you got to lock the door and go in the closet and not talk to a soul and uh, keep the TV off and you know fast and and then then you can maybe get into the secret place do you know how simple God is he said Pam just step into it well I did I said I stepped into the secret place I said God I'm step stepping into your secret place right now by faith knowing that it is for me as soon as I did that there was an immediate shift immediate I felt something shift it's almost like that cloud of grief just left so I want to encourage you whatever you're dealing with if it's a hard place if it's a place that doesn't look like it has any end many of our situations can look like that I'm going to encourage you to learn to step into the secret place with Jesus. The secret place of Almighty God where he, is, he lifts you up far above all situations and circumstances and gives you the victory. He gives you the vision above what you might be facing. And so I want to encourage you. I don't have this in my notes, so I'm thinking somebody needs this. Can I just say that? Okay. So I want you to know that one of the things that you have to have in order to win victory is to have self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. That means you learn how to restrain what you're used to doing that gets you in trouble. And you guys know what that might be. You have the ability by the Spirit to have self-control. You have supernatural self-control. Everything about God is above nature. It's above your flesh. So you can have supernatural self-control. And that is going to be something that we have to learn, the essential part of that that we have. We must have uh, self-control in where we go, what we do, what we say, and how we live our lives, and breaking those habit patterns. Some of the habits that we've had that have struggled, that we struggle, that have taken us down a wrong path and crippled us is because we did not use self-control. So that we, we talk about the peace of God, we talk about, about the victory of God, we talk about all these things, but there's things that we need to coordinate ourselves with the Lord and obey Him, and one of them, it's not peace, it's not joy, yes, that's part of it, but I'm throwing it out there, you need to have self-control. If you don't have self-control over something, then you need to surrender that to the Holy Spirit and say, God, you have given me the spirit of self-control by your spirit. You have the nature of Christ in you, the nature of Jesus. He, you have been, he, he has caused you to become dead to sin. Sin has no power over you. And you are alive to God, alive in Christ in victory in triumphant victory. That's who you really are. So what, what is a next step for some, some of these areas of your life that you feel weak or in, in, unable to, to have victory over? You need to realize that you have the ability to have self-control that has been divinely imparted to you by the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It is something that lives in you and also, one of the things that I want you to do when you go home tonight, if there's something that you're struggling with and it's a habit, maybe nobody knows about it, maybe everybody knows about it, but what I want you to do, I want you to go to the Lord and I want you to say to Jesus, Lord Jesus, this, I am dead to this according to your word because I died in you and, I, and sin has no power over me. So I declare this habit, whatever it might be, you have no power over me. I put you to death. That's called dying to self. And I'd say that's a lot of self-control. So that's another area that I feel like we have to come in line with God. We have to come in line with the, the plans and purposes of God. If you read the teachings of Paul, he is very, very clear about all this. And um, so we're not going to have peace sometimes. We're not going to have victory sometimes until we have self-control. 
that we can get victory over that. We can, co we can coordinate and cooperate with the Holy Spirit and the new man, the new nature in Christ, and we can declare that thing is dead. We can put it to death. And that's what Paul said we have to do. I don't think you, you hear about this a lot, but if you read what Paul taught, that's what's in there. And we need to exercise that. We need to appropriate it. A lot of our lack of, of experience as believers where we're not experiencing, experiencing the things we want to is because we're not practically applying that. Listen, the Bible is simple. It's easy when you just apply it and do it. So I declare this situation, I am dead to sin and I am alive to God. I am alive in victory in Jesus by the power of the resurrection in me. This is a good declaration for some of you that are struggling with old habits. And that might even be a drug addiction. You know, all kinds of addictions out there. It's a good idea that you attack that thing in the authority of the, of the name of Jesus. And one of the ways that you can attack that thing and, and exercise self-control in it is declare it as dead. You have no power over me in Jesus' name. I am alive to God and dead to sin. This is a confession that I don't hear taught very much, but I have found it to be so amazingly um, healing, amazingly um, free. It's, it's another area of walking in freedom, is having self-control and taking authority over your own sin. And, not, and this is called the zero tolerance method that Paul taught. <clears throat> So it's not all about demons, but I'm telling you this in advance because when we start dealing with the demonic, we want to close the doors on where he has found access. And he finds access when we don't have self-control, when we are not taking authority and not, and not walking in, in, when we're walking in the flesh and we're giving ourselves over to the flesh and the sin that so easily besets us, when we're giving into that, well, you know, he's going to find ground to work in. So I want you to have a preliminary uh, hint, not just a hint, but I want you to have a preliminary introduction to walking in freedom and declaring and getting authority over your flesh. So we've talked so far a bit getting authority over, taking authority over your mind and your thoughts and your flesh and the, the willful things that are in your flesh that demand its own way. I heard somebody tell a funny story about fasting and this person a great minister a great uh, teacher of the word whom i've sat under for many years and admire and really you know but everybody has their own struggles well he was going to go on a fast and he was going to seek the lord about some things about a direction for where he was supposed to go and his his ministry next and all of that so so he was setting himself away to God. And this is an example of how our flesh is so used to getting its way. It's, it throws tantrums. So, yeah, so uh, he, he put himself aside and he was spending time with God and praying and in a quiet place and praying and, and he heard, I want to watch TV. I'm going to miss that program if I don't go turn that on. Oh, I forgot to record it. And he heard all this going on in his head. This is his flesh talking. You see, the flesh doesn't want to obey God. It says in the Bible that the flesh is at enmity with God. Your flesh is an enemy of God. So you don't want to modify your behavior. You don't want to modify and, and just, you want to put it to death. You want to disallow that to live in you because you want to live in Christ in the power of his name, in the power of that new nature that he has given you, where you are rising up and you are children of the kingdom. You are royal blood in Jesus Christ, living and walking in the kingdom of God. And so we are learning how to overcome these things that, and live in the newness of life that God has freely given you. You don't have to do anything to earn that. Jesus already paid the price that he would come and live inside of you and empower you to live a new life. And so we're at, we're at odds with him when we are not applying 
what we can and what we need to and what we are learning to, to deal with our own flesh. Basically, we don't have to modify the behavior, we just need to put it to death. Okay, does that, I know that's harsh, but read Paul. He, he talks all about it. This is something that will bring you to a new level of victory. It will also shut the door on the demonic because they are looking for avenues to get to you. And I'll talk more about that later. We have an enemy that never sleeps, that never gives up. He is constantly planning ways and means to bring destruction or to undermine our faith. He was always a murderer from the beginning. He is a liar and he comes to steal and kill and destroy. In John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you or they may have life and that life to the fullest. That is God's will for you. That's what Jesus said. He says, I don't want you to be stolen and robbed by the enemy that wants to destroy your, your destiny, that wants to destroy your victory, that wants to destroy your family, wants to destroy your, your, your physical health, whatever it might be. The thief comes to do that. And I said this last week, if you're, uh, if you're gonna have any kind of smarts at all, which I know you all do, okay, you are not going to, if you're in your living room and you're just minding your own business, watching TV or reading the paper or whatever, and somebody barges in, breaks the door down, and declares, I'm gonna steal everything you have. I'm here to take your stuff. Okay, wait just a minute, uh, get out of my house. This is how we need to treat the devil when he shows up like that. We're not going to be passive. We're not gonna sit around and think, well, gosh, I guess since this has happened to me, I guess, I guess I've, I guess I've sort of been doing something wrong or, or maybe, you know, and, and we get all confused and we don't, there's no confusion in the simplicity of the gospel. You do not allow that bully to come in and steal from you. And if that's happening, this is where you rise up in the authority of the name of Jesus and you put him right in his place, put him out the front door and take all of your devils with you. And uh, I know this is almost sounds like a cartoon, but it brings about a visual that I think makes it easy to understand. And I learned that, I have learned that many times in my early walk with the Lord when I was learning about warfare. That's one of the th first things God taught me when I was a baby Christian. And um, he, there, there, I had had so much torment in my life when I came to the Lord and I had so much need of deliverance and so, much need of healing in my emotions in my mind and Jesus faithfully and lovingly began to take me through that process as he is all of you by the way and mind you underline patiently and lovingly because that's your Lord he loves you and is patient with where we are he meets you right where you are so what happened was I began to realize that I felt like so many things had gone on in my home. It was strife and brokenness and all kinds of stuff going on. There was people coming over smoking pot and all this other stuff. I'm talking about this was back in the 70s during that whole hippie era. And um, I was just so fed up with it. I just thought I felt all of a sudden God opened my eyes to feel the oppression of where my life had been and how hard that was for me. And I literally walked through my house and flung open every door. The neighbors must have thought I was a loony, but I don't know. They never came over and complained. But I threw that devil out. I said, you are leaving my house. I command you to leave every room in my house now in Jesus' name. I mean, it's almost like the Holy Spirit just gave me that instruction. I mean, that is not normal to act that way. And I was a new believer, but you know, I didn't know what normal was. I just knew that I was done with it. And so I began to experience a new freedom in my home, a new peace in my home after that. So some of you might need to do that. If there's been all kinds of trouble in your house, if there's been all kinds of things going on, if you've had been in the occult, 
if there's been drug use, whatever it may have been, if there's been strife, brokenness, you need to kick that devil out and start afresh and say, listen, this house is a house of prayer. This is a house that is blessed of God, that his presence fills my home, where he is welcome. And you need to turn that around. And that's just another step of what you can do. It's, it's not all about you getting fixed. And there's things you can do outwardly, too. And I will we'll talk more about that as much uh, later. So he says, the devil has millions of demons under his command. We are not to live in mental fear, but we are to be vigilant. It states in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be, sto- be sober, be well-balanced and self-disciplined, be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. But you resist him. You resist him. And we'll, ha- we'll give some practical uh, teaching about how to resist him. Firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, and immovable. In other words, you don't give up. You don't back down. You're rooted in the truth. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world, you might not suffer alone. We are submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, as stated in James 4, verse 7. So submit to the authority of God. Resist the devil and stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. So what is in that resisting? Part of that resisting is casting him out. And uh, he will flee from you. Come close to God with a contrite heart, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Be cleansed. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That says so much in that one phrase in the Bible where it says you wash your hands. You know, what have you had your hands into? What have you had your life into? What have you been paying attention to? Purify your heart. Be pure in your heart from bitterness, unforgiveness, doubt, unbelief, anger, whatever it might be that is troubling you. Guilt or shame or condemnation. Purify your heart from that. That isn't from God. That isn't from him. So, and it says, and purify your unfaithful hearts, you double-minded people. It says in the Bible that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unstable in all his ways, double-mindedness. I think what God is saying, I want you to be single-minded to my will, to my purpose, to my word. I want you to be kingdom-minded. I want you to realize that I am the Lord God Almighty, your King. You are my children. I have given you abundant life. I have given you everything you need to live an upright, righteous life and to obtain victory in any and all situations. You keep your eye and your thoughts in that regard, and you're not going to be double-minded, wavering back and forth like a ship in a storm. You know, a ship in a storm can lose all of its cargo. And I think that's what happens to Christians. They get double-minded, shifting back and forth, wavering. You know, not, but you need to just be deliberate. You need to be sober-minded, the Bible says. Clear-minded, clear thinking. Have clarity. I'm going to pray over you for the clarity that God has will for you because some of you have got a lot of troubles in your thought life. I can tell this today. So God wants that to be, we want to clear that up here tonight before you go. Um, so um, in 2 Corinthians, here's another, we don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices. So ignorance is another problem that we must face, that we must admit, and we must overcome. We are not to be ignorant. Unfortunately, the devil who loves to hide the fact that he's real in a lot of churches. Somebody was telling me how a pastor ran out of the room when a demon manifested. Well, that's not going to (laughs) work. 
but, but you see, there hasn't been that understanding. There hasn't been that, that awareness or that equipping or that, that knowledge of the authority that we have in Jesus' name. So we, um, we don't want to be ignorant. And I can guarantee you, Christians that are ignorant of Satan's devices are in defeat probably most of the time. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, if you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one and what I have forgiven. If I have forgiven anything, has, it has been for your sake in the presence and, on the, and the approval of Christ. To keep Satan from taking advantage of us, we are not ignorant of his schemes. So that is almost a mandate. We are not going to be ignorant of his schemes. He's a schemer. He's a scammer, a schemer, and, uh, and a thief, and what else? We've got so many names for him. So anyway, uh, 1 John 5, 18, we know with confidence that anyone born of God does not habitually sin. Now, okay, that's confusing to some people because all of you are born of God, but many of you say, well, I'm still dealing with sin in my life. I don't have victory over this area of my life. That, uh, that part of you that is born of God is your spirit. Your spirit is born of him. In him, you have been made complete. In him, you have been made perfect. That spirit that is born again is without sin. So that's that spirit within you that Jesus calls you to be born of him, it is without sin. So you can say that over yourself, I am not a sinner. I am, I am saved, I'm born of God, I have his nature, I have the ability to overcome sin. And so I want you to see yourself as a living spirit that is complete in Christ instead of struggling with the old man who's supposed to be dead. So it, it changes your whole perspective about who, where you are in your walk with the Lord. So, um, so, let me go back one more time. We know with confidence that anyone born of God does not habitually sin, but he, Jesus, who was born of God, carefully keeps and protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Do you know the devil cannot touch your spirit? Because your spirit is perfect and without sin. And that's who you are. Think about that for a minute. I know you're going to have to think about that for a while, because... Many of you are still living in the struggle with your old man, wrestling with the old man like it's still a living thing. And uh, you need to realize that the life of God that is within you in your born-again spirit is without sin, and the devil cannot touch it. So that's why a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. You can be demonized and under the influence of, but you cannot be demon-possessed because your spirit is made perfect and the devil cannot touch you. I'm sorry, that's not accurate. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for that. I'm, I'm, I'm recording this. Okay, let me wait. Okay. So we know that we know for a fact that we are of God and the whole world around us lies in the power of the evil one opposing God and his will and his plan and precepts. So this is a prayer that I'm going to lead you through. And uh, I'm going to ask you to, um, uh, to, if you would like to, we're going to put on the whole armor of God. We talked about that last week. So now we're going to follow through with a, a practical application of that, okay? So uh, I want you to repeat this after me. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. Heavenly Father, we come together in agreement. Heavenly Father, we come together in agreement. Father God, you are awesome and wonderful. You are magnificent and mighty. You have provided victory in every area. Your name holds more authority than I could ever conceive. You are stronger than I, than I could ever dream. You are wise, wiser than I can comprehend. You are more loving and compassionate than I've ever understood. You, God, are above all. Thank you for the powerful armor that you give to me. 
I come this day to put on the belt of truth. I acknowledge that I need truth. I dedicate myself to the truth. And I follow the truth of your word. I need to make reading your word a priority in my life. I sincerely open my mind to your word. And I and thank you, Holy Spirit, that you reveal your word to me and bring increase into my life from the truth that lives in me. As I am praying this prayer, I realize that the enemy of my soul wants to condemn me for my failures. He's constantly accusing me. I declare today, I will not let the enemy condemn me for any lack of success because you are pleased with me, Lord, when I try. You are made strong in my weaknesses. You want me to learn to be content and trust you. You love me anyway, always, no matter what. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I acknowledge that I am able to wear this breastplate because Jesus took my sin and gave me his righteousness. Lord, I will remind myself today of the enormous place, excuse me, the enormous price that Jesus paid that I could be set free. Jesus did not take sin lightly, and I will not take sin lightly. I will show respect and adoration to you, Lord. I seek to obey you you and to please you, you. and I seek you with all my heart. I I draw near to you. you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Spirit. that you fill me with your presence this night. I put on the shoes of peace. peace. Thank you for your peace peace. that has come to dwell in me me. and has found a home in my heart. I feel restful and serene as I think about the glorious place that I shall spend eternity and that I can live heaven on earth. I put on the helmet of salvation. I thank you for eternal salvation, for the saving power of Jesus Christ that daily works in my life, helping me to defeat sin and to put on and be filled with the love of Jesus. Thank you that you are renewing my mind and showing me how to defeat my wrong thoughts and wrong attitudes. Thank you that you are taking me from the way I've always been In any, go- in, in any ungodly way, you bring me into the godly way to be just like you. I will raise up the shield of faith and deflect the attacks of the enemy. My shield is a shield of confidence. You are able to take care of me, Lord. I continually remind myself of your faithfulness and your goodness. goodness. I will be unwavering in my devotion to you this day. And I pick up the sword of the Spirit, Spirit, which is the Word of God. God. I will give voice to the Word today. I will will become more and more comfortable comfortable speaking out the Scripture. scripture. Lord, I will remind myself that when I speak your word, the power of that word is unleashed. 
by faith. By faith. You have given me your words that changes the world around me. I dedicate my, my mouth to you, that my words will please you, that, my, that I have greater control over my tongue. I dare declare today, I will use my tongue to bless you, to bless others, and to avoid strife and unnecessary conflict. Father, as I leave this time in prayer, I freshen my focus on Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you bring, bring clarity to my thoughts. I turn my thoughts toward you. Thank you for mind peace and heart peace. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your touch and that you fill me afresh this day by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.